Thank you so much, and thanks again for having this colloquium. I have to say, I really feel like you are my people. <laughs> I spend a lot of time talking with scientists who are desperate to communicate their information better because they want to help people to make the right health decisions. And it's great to have people to understand that communicating science is a science. So CDC has a lot of public health information to get out there, and, and my job includes all of it. Um, much of the information, if people are seeking it and it's fact-based, they can come in, get their information, go. Reporters come in, do interviews, publish stories. It's great. Almost all of the time that I spend on how to communicate things better is because there is some element of public controversy. And there has been a lot of discussion about how the scientific information comes into conflict with beliefs. And that's the title of my talk, was When Science Threatens Beliefs or Values. And it's very often set up the way someone made this slide for me, and I didn't change it because I thought it really illustrated something, which is that it is an either or. That if you believe science, you can't then keep your core values and beliefs. And I've regularly had this uh, other conversation, which is we all think we've got the halo, and the people who don't agree with us on whatever issue it is that many have been brought up today, they're them. We're us. They're them. They don't get the science. They don't understand. They don't appreciate it. Um, or um, they have the evil motives or financial motives or whatever it is. I want to say that I think when we communicate about things, we don't un actually understand how people are hearing or processing that information on a regular basis. The information we've heard this morning is tremendously helpful in getting us further to that. But the only way, I think, to really understand what people are thinking is to ask them and engage with them. And here's what most people get their science from. This is the basic science education of almost every American, right? The archetypes that are so incredibly common are the mad scientist, the evil or incompetent government, the mutant who either because they were an everyman before they got their mutant powers decides to use their mutant powers for good, or the mutant who it decides to use their powers. But everything is bad about science in our entertainment industry portrayal. And CDC is often pictured in all kinds of television series and whatever. My kids have stopped calling me in the room to hear about it every time something's on, because it's so common. But the idea is that Government can fall into the evil side just as easily as we can fall into the good side when you have only two sides. Now, I've, I sort of, I thought I coined this term, but I don't know. I'm calling it information terrorism, where people are actually in different cells, but they share beliefs, and it is their motivation to spread disinformation to try to get people into their site or believing what they believe. And for the most part, if people are there to make money and they're using information for clickbait, that's their motivation. They're not caring about what you do and don't believe. They just want you to click on it. So they're actually outside of the values part on this. About half the stuff that I see that's wrong on social media, I think to myself, somebody actually thought that was funny. Somebody created that and thought it was humorous to put something out, and then it got picked up because of the other piece, which is people want to know the answers. So this chart right here, and there are several versions of this on the internet, um, but the original version of this puts in the two um, axes here. On the bottom is your political from liberal to conservative. On the top is the fact-based uh, ratio. 
So we as scientists, we always want to be right up there at the top in that green box where it's just the facts, you're getting it all, it's unbiased, it's, you know, or it considers both sides. And most of the publication and a lot of the places where we go to get information as scientists or people who appreciate scientists are up in that green box. Right, then the yellow box is fair analysis of the news or the facts or the research or the data. And it might present both sides. It might clearly take one side, but it might include both sides in there. As you move down further, you get into either incomplete um, presentation of the facts or even further into what people are calling propaganda or fake news. And then at the bottom is just stuff that's completely made up and tailored to a particular audience that wants to hear all of that. When I give this talk, almost all the time, I will ask people, you don't have to tell me which side, but you know which side you look at. And if you look at one side, you almost never also look at the other side. And my contention is that that is a real problem. At CDC, my audience is the entire American public and the world in many cases. I have to go where they're getting their news. I have to be on both sides. And it was incredibly eye-opening to me to begin to force myself to look at both sides on almost every issue because it affects how I change and frame the issues that I'm putting out there. Sometimes it affects the wording. Sometimes it affects my own perception of what people are thinking of me. And it reminds me of a story when I first started working at CDC, I was working on uh, autism early awareness and sitting down with parents who truly believe that their child was injured by vaccines. They're out there posting that stuff on the internet because they really believe that someone made a decision that injured their child. And they're sharing information. They have become a proponent of that point of view because they're trying to protect other children. As long as we're thinking about them as them, the ignorant or the uninformed or the people we need to change, we'll never buy into that. They share the same value as us, which is protecting children. We just have to learn to talk across to the other side. So CDC often communicates not just during um, times of controversy, but during emergencies. And all of the way your brain processes information in an emergency can also be very similar to a time when you're highly conflicted about information. So you have the fight or flight, you can also have freeze, all these other emotions can come into it. And what we do as practitioners of public health communication is try to get to that point I was making about finding out what your audience needs. What do they need? What do they want? So I could say they need the information because they need to change. But if they don't want it because they're not looking at it, they don't believe what you're saying, none of that is going to work. Engaging the community. So Vish gave some great examples about why you have to engage all communities. But this was um, a real demonstration that happened during the Zika virus outbreak in Puerto Rico. And these people were protesting the application of insecticides to kill the mosquitoes, which were spreading Zika and really endangering um, pregnant women. But the people here, they all felt like they were doing the right thing. They felt that they were saving their community from exposure to toxic chemicals that were also raining down on them. There were two sides to this issue that both had the same concerns. One of the places that, that we've talked about how you know, social media is so important for the government to be active on social media is a little bit different, partially because of our stature, partially because of our general clearance, and partially because all the words that we have in our scientific uh, communications um, have trouble being cut back. But I think we need you all and all of the people who align with research and values to get out there on social media. Every time you see something, do you retweet it? Do you comment on it? Because if you're not part of the group that's helping to further the information, 
other people who are doing that with misinformation are ahead of you. And I wanted to also mention the power of stories. We don't do that very well as scientists, right? Ethan Linderberger, who just initially tweeted that he was getting vaccinated on his 18th birthday after his mom, who got her health information from Facebook, um, you know, he was taking his health into his own hands, and it became a huge thing. This is him testifying in front of the Senate. The fact is that we, as people in science, don't tell stories very well. And I know there's a session about this coming up. I'm very excited about that. But I think we also need to tell the stories instead of just give the data. So I'm almost done. I tried very hard to work with the CDC scientists to you know, not use the, the jargon, to tell the stories, to relate, to, to buy into the drama. That's what gets you the news coverage when there's a story that has some kind of conflict, some kind of story arc, and that people can relate to. And for any of you who are interested in how we do risk communication, CDC has the crisis and emergency risk communication template online. This is free and available to use that has all of the ways that we work through when a crisis first looms to make sure that we're trying to take all of this into account. Thank you very much.